Life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hello, everybody. I am Marshall, and today I am being joined in the Geek Cave by my brother-in-law, Lainey's husband, Corey. Hey, what's up, peoples? Corey is joining us today because we're talking something uh, that isn't books specifically, and it isn't uh, a lot of the other things we're talking about. We're actually talking today about Batman, the bat suit, and who wore it best. <laughs> Just to introduce myself, my interest in comics, Batman is my number one. As a kid, I would see comics at, you could only see them at pretty much drugstores, convenience stores, and I have memories of that. Later on, we'd go to Toys R Us, and they'd have these kind of bargain packs of comic books that you got. It would be random. You'd have no story continuity. It would just be two or three random ones. Later in, about junior high, I, I kind of conned my grandma into subscribing <laughs> me to comics because she used to give me this Ranger Rick comic out of the blue. I never asked for it. She just sent it to me. So I I actually got two titles out of her, which was Batman and Green Arrow and later t the Teen Titans, which is one of my all times. And then later a, a friend of mine handed me this book called The Dark Knight Returns. Mm. Um, for a long time, I only had a handful, basically about three inches on a bookshelf worth of graphic novels because I didn't have the money to, to buy individual issues. And that was like Dark Knight Returns, Killing Joke, Gotham by Gaslight, Arkham Asylum, and the great Alex Ross books, mm. uh, Kingdom Come and Marvels. This guy is a painter. Yeah. His stuff takes a long time and he rarely does full books, but those are a couple of full books that he did that were Universe of DC. Kingdom Come was, Kingdom Come was amazing. It was uni uh, DC Universe and then Marvels was mo obviously Marvel Universe. So for a long time it was just those and I've... Later, kind of around 2005, I started getting into more, and now I'm kind of like all over the place with lots of different things. It's really a golden age of comics now. But Batman's always been my number one, and it's the one thing I've allowed myself to be kind of a troll about, uh, <laughs> even before we had that term troll. Um, I try to be a nice person in general, but yeah, we'll get into what I thought about some of the movies that came out. Hmm. So before we really get into all of this, what you drinking, Corey? I am drinking the Tropicana Watermelon Breeze. Now, I saw this in the store, and I generally avoid sugar-heavy juices because adult-onset diabetes, mm. you know, flirting with that, don't really want to deal with that. But I found this at a store we don't normally go to, and it's actually not that bad on sugar. It's got, like, grape and apple juice like all the juices do, but it's really good. I enjoyed it. I'm currently drinking some coffee from Panera. We recently found out that they have this specialty subscription service where for eight ninety nine a month, you get unlimited, basically regular coffees and hot teas for free. I guess it's not really for free if you have eight ninety nine. But what's great about it is they have this deal where you can get the subscription for three months for free. And the first month, if you cancel within the first month, you literally paid nothing. So we're trying that out. And this is their iced coffee with Madagascan vanilla syrup. Ooh, fancy. Um, sounds fancy. Don't taste that way. <laughs> it's 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 vanilla. Mm. Okay, so we're talking about Batman, and Batman is not my favorite DC character. Um, it's not your favorite combo character because you're more of a Spider Man guy, right? I like Spider Man, and I like Green Lantern a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. come to really appreciate him more over mm -hmm. the years. Yeah. But you just don't get that much television from Green Lantern. You don't get as much movies from Green Lantern. And when you do get a movie from Green Lantern, you wish you hadn't. Although, so. prop propers to the the CG Green Lantern animated series, mm, yeah. it was a little exaggerated on the character design, but it was a lot of fun. It had kind of almost a Star Trek kind of feel to it, where there was a weekly kind of episodic thing. It was good. I enjoyed it. Well, at the same time, like the character design that I saw in those was derived very much from the style of the Batman animated series and the Superman animated series. Yeah, yeah, it was just yeah. CGI. Yeah. And a lot of us get our, our idea of Batman, at least I do, from the animated series. Yeah, absolutely. See, he's basically 12 years younger than me. So for me growing up, all I had was the 60s show, which is mm -hmm. kind of lampooned, but now kind of celebrated. Actually, they brought that into comic 
books with kind of a mm-hmm. meta knowing version of uh, the Batman sixty six. So that's all I had growing up. But it makes sense he would have the he was actually blessed to have the Batman the animated as his oh, first because yeah. yes. that was it's still a masterpiece. There's no no other words for it. Okay. So when we're going through or we're looking at all of these different actors who have portrayed Bruce Wayne throughout the ages, who really drives it home like this person is Batman to you? Well, the thing, it was funny because Lainey brought this up to me because she had seen it online. People were saying who their favorite Batman was. I would say that the Christopher Nolan, the Dark Knight movies are my favorite movies. I do enjoy Christian Bale in general, but... He's not necessarily my favorite Batman, but I would say he's my favorite Batman in the movies so far. Mm-hmm. But we just touched on it. Batman animated series, Kevin Conroy is, is going to be my favorite Batman until somebody else comes along and topples that. He did such a good job. Most people don't necessarily think about voiceovers that much, but he actually changed the voice from when he was Bruce Wayne to when he was Batman. Mm-hmm. Um, not in a way that... Christian Bale did, it did that, which didn't annoy me, honestly, as much as it did a lot of people. But that's because I'm not an internet guy that likes to complain about everything. I would say it's kind of a mixed bag there, where it's kind of like, yes, I like the Nolan movies, but Kevin Conroy did an amazing job. From what I've seen, a lot of the other animated versions of Batman all kind of try and emulate Kevin Conroy's portrayal. They like I hear the vocal ticks from Kevin Conroy being repeated in these other voice actors. And that's the thing. Like, I don't know about other voice actors. I have listened to actual podcasts and heard them talk about their stories, but off the top of my head, can't remember. But Kevin Conroy was like a theater-trained guy. He never planned to be necessarily a voice over mm-hmm. actor, but that he kind of stumbled into it through auditioning. And he, he just really proved that that's, he, that was really his place to shine w- with that really good, amazing voice that he had. So, out of the movie Batmans that we've had, the movie Batmans, which one of them is the best of them? I mean, so we've had uh, Michael Keaton in Batman and Batman Returns. We've had Val Kilmer in Batman Forever. George Clooney in Batman and Robin. Christian Bale, Nolan Trilogy. And then Ben Affleck in the more recent movies. And we have Robert Pattinson coming for the new The Batman. Okay, I will split my decision here. Like I just said, Christian Bale was in the best was in the best Batman movies, and he did. I think he did a good job of really being that kind of wounded person that Bruce Wayne is after losing his parents when he was a kid. I thought he did a decent job with that. But I would say that George Clooney was. I still say this: George Clooney was the best Bruce Wayne. He was in the far worst movie that's ever been made, <laughs> but. If you think about this, if you think about Bruce Wayne you, and you read two sentences about who he is and what his upbringing is, this is like the heir apparent to a dynasty, a ginormous company, like corporation. That's who this is. Now, when I saw Michael Keaton, I'm sorry, he's a blue collar dude from Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't ever buy him, ever buy him as Bruce Wayne. And, you know, I have my issues with that that movie, which we might get into. But casting-wise, no, I never bought him. But when I saw, when you see George Clooney walking yeah, in a tuxedo, being... boom. Number one, he is showbiz royalty right. in the sense that his aunt was Rosemary Clooney. If you've ever seen White Christmas, that's his aunt. So he has that in, his, in him a little bit that, you know, and so... He still thinks he ruined that movie. Um, I don't think he did. I think the movie was ruined by the writing and the directing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of where I'd have to split it in those. I'm really picky about casting, so we'll get to my other thing when we get to the uh, the Joker about casting. But um, I, I felt like Christian Bale made for a good younger Bruce Wayne, one that is still very traumatized and still trying to work his way through it. And yeah, George Clooney did a very good job of being an older Batman, one that is mentoring somebody else, because now he's actually got another person and their trauma to try and actually heal his own. I felt like that that did actually play off very well. How do you feel about Robert Pattinson casting for the Batman? I honestly think it's interesting to me when you see a young actor get famous for one thing and then make the decision that that's not where they want to go. Notable, definitely Johnny Depp, 
Mm-hmm. They tried to turn him into the teen heartthrob. He was on the show 21 Jump Street, all that stuff. And they, they tried to turn him into that. And we obviously saw he ended up as Jack Sparrow. Edward Scissorhands, a lot of weird characters. That's where he went. Brad Pitt kind of went the same way as well. He plays the leading man, but he's a little quirky. So this is kind of what Robin Pattinson has been doing. He's been in a lot of indie weird movies in the since Twilight. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt until I see the movie. I never, to, for me, judging a movie until it comes out is kind of I don't know what it is. It's what the internet loves to do. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I'll give him. I'll give him. A, I like that trailer. That trailer was really cool. Their casting choices for this movie are, are interesting to me, and in that it does. Like they decided to go somewhat colorblind. Well, with totally this. colorblind. Yeah, and yeah. I, I look at these characters, and I'm like, yeah, I feel like these guys could actually portray these characters very well. Yeah, um, well, and dude, really bring a new level to them. Dude, Je- uh, Jeffrey Wright, the guy. Oh is, yeah, uh, from Gordon. Yeah, he's Gordon, and he's from Westworld. Mm-hmm. Um, Zoe Kravitz as Selena Kyle will be mm-hmm. interesting as well. It's not. It's interesting to see. I mean, for a lot of people, it's hard for them to break out of what they know. But honestly, it's healthy to change yeah. children. It's healthy to break out of your one ways of seeing things. And I, I'm always open to that. It's looking interesting. And def- Andy Circus to see Gollum mm-hmm. as as Alfred is going <laughs> to yeah. be an interesting thing. It's going to be an interesting thing for him because he always plays weird characters. So to let him be able to see what he's like as a kind of more straight and warm character would be interesting. And since you just talked about Alfred, let's, let's dive into it. I've actually found... More actors that have portrayed Alfred than have been portraying Bruce Wayne. Yeah, that's true. There's been a <laughs> lot. Um, so what? Oh, we were talking the other day. Was there an Alfred in the Batman sixty six? There was. Okay. It, it was Alan Napier, um, but he was not the first person to portray Alfred. In fact, most of us get our idea of how Alfred looks. From somebody who was in a 43, 1943 yeah, they Batman, the old ones, yeah. his name was William Austin. Now, before William Austin came in, Alfred was actually portrayed as being pudgy and overweight. Mm. But then, and he was completely clean shaven. William Austin, he was this skinny guy and he had this characteristic mustache. Little pencil mustache, yeah. That has ever since been the way that we think of Alfred. That's awesome. Yeah, I um I don't I haven't seen a lot of those old the '40s shorts. You might be able to find them on YouTube. I mean, the costumes are silly, and they did the best they could at the time. Mm-hmm. But I know I remember when I first got DC Universe, which unfortunately R.I.P. doesn't exist anymore. They actually put those on there, so you could actually watch the re- the very first incarnations of Batman. So then one person portrayed Alfred through all of the old Batman the 90s, movies. Yeah, the 90s. So uh, it, that was Michael Goh. And like I didn't really remember much of what he was all about until Batman and Robin, where he really became a character. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, uh, there was that, those movies were so Hollywood studio run that it seemed like they fumbled a lot. With characters specifically, they yeah. didn't really kind of know what to do. He he was great. He was very warm, very grandfatherly in a, in a way. And when you get to the animated series, you have Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. If, if anybody remembers Remington Steele, is hearing this. That's his daughter oh, was the lead. Okay. So she's Stephanie Zimbalist, mm-hmm. the main character. I can't remember her name, but that's who who it was. That's her dad. But he had a great great actor voice. I thought he's kind of the one I my go-to as far as favorite, I'd say, until you get to like Michael Caine, who when he just starts getting those little mm. like tears in his eyes and you just like, okay, I'm done, Michael Caine. You've slain me. It's over. Michael Caine is the best Alfred I have ever seen. I mean, you can't throw Michael Caine in there and not expect him to actually try and put something in the character. But... Also, the way that they kind of talked about his past and the personality that he had in him—that he was, that he used to be military. It yeah, explained they did that. so much. When they started, when he starts talking about the Joker and just seeing people that want to watch the world burn, that was great. That was a very nice touch of the very. They they kept it to that one scene, but it was a killer scene. He's normally, for those of you who don't Michael, he's he's more like kind of like he's played a rough guy, rough and tumble guy, or a womanizer in his past, uh, but. There was a movie called Satter House Rules where he started playing mm-hmm. this kind of grandfatherly character, which is great. But 
let's ditch the main accent because he could never handle that with his Cockney. So it was nice to see him it fully having everything he needed to, to really make a good play at this role. Um, it was, it, he's, he was still great. Those ones, I know I've heard, I've had people complain about those Nolan movies, but those were kind of like my little trove of graphic mm-hmm. novels that I held on to for years. Those ones will be mine until I see another Batman that I, that I really appreciate. And actually, the Michael Caine portrayal of Alfred, I feel, interfaces very well with the Sean Pertwee from from Gotham. The way that they had Alfred in Gotham, I feel, was inspired by the Nolan portrayal of him. Yeah, it was fun. I can honestly say I haven't seen much of Gotham. I watched a little bit of the first season. But I did like to see him just have Bruce, like, training Bruce in a way, just to kind of get his anger out, which is not even something I've even seen in my favorite Batman comics, which is like Bruce is always determined and he did it kind of on his own, the learning all the martial arts and stuff. I liked that portrayal. The fact that it was like it was a almost a psychological thing where like we're gonna help you out, Bruce. We're gonna like get get you through this rough time, which I I really like. I totally buy and I actually really like the idea of Batman going all over the world to learn martial arts, but learning boxing from Alfred yeah. is just excellent because like that's that's what they would learn in in military like that's a really good one person to one person fighting style it's also really good for fighting multiple people well just because Alfred was has seen tragedy has seen trauma yeah it knows what it's like when someone's going through it and he got through it himself and was still you know mentally intact enough to see that what this kid was going through and know exactly what he you know kind of needed so yeah, that was that was enjoyable. I'm actually generally open to like different interpretations. I don't have necessarily one interpretation, but when it came to certain movies, I was like, the casting was off. But I I literally will give different interpretations a shot because even those graphic novels I told you about, they're very they're very different, oh, yeah. very different. So uh, speaking of interpretations, then Jeremy Irons as Alfred. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, How do you uh, feel about that? Cuz I felt like that that came off really dry. Yeah, the problem again, these movies they kind of went from overblown Hollywood spectacles to Nolan who really kind of tightened it up and ratcheted it up the fact that it is every kid will tell you if he says he likes Batman, he's because he's just a guy that still fights crime to the level that he fights it. He's not Superman. He doesn't have the superpowers. And that's what Nolan really did with him is bring the reality in. And then it went to Snyder, which I, I'm i never really going to defend. I mean, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with this Snyder <laughs> cut. But I, uh, I Snyder did Sucker Punch, this movie that was just literally about effects and barely any story yeah. to it. I can't really defend. I actually think Jeremy Irons was the one of the best things in that movie. But he was responding to the script. So when you have an yeah. actor, there's never going to be anything bad about the guy that played Scar. I mean, he's amazing. Jeremy Irons is amazing. But it was just kind of like what he had to work with. And honestly, like I, I, I think I love Ben Affleck as a person. He's had some issues with acting. So that's another part of it is you have you can only play off what you have. So it's really hard to be a good actor in a bad script, in a bad movie. You can only do as much as you can. So that unfortunately is that. I, I, I would give him honorable mention for going getting through that movie. Maybe everybody that was in that movie <laughs> going, going through that movie. But um, yeah. Okay. So this, this is now going to get into a little bit of a multiverse question here. Yeah. Because this, this question actually has three different answers according to the official DC Universe Who's the best Joker? That's interesting. So, before you get into that, we'll we'll go really quickly through the list of some of the most notable Jokers through mm-hmm. history. You have Caesar Romero from the old '60s series, who was such a diva. Mm-hmm. Um, he had to keep his mustache while the makeup was on his face, and that just made it ugly. You had Jack Nicholson in the old Batman movie. Uh, Batman Mark movie Hamill now. is. The voice is the voice of Joker, and then you have Heath Ledger from the Nolan trilogy. Well, yeah, there's others as well, but we could. I think if we keep it to this, okay, that's good. I literally remember this is a weird thing to say, but I 
we my brother and I went to go see Batman eighty nine on a one person scooter, both of us on <laughs> it. Um, uh, that's always kind of a memory I hold. So I was, of course, I was excited because I love Batman. I wanted to see it. I I can't even remember exactly. I know things. I think I remember some initial things I didn't like, but man. Uh, the more I watch that movie, I just can't stand it. Number one, I just hate that they make him say, I'm Batman to every, every crookie. It, that just drives me nuts. But with Jack Nicholson, if you know a little bit about Hollywood works, it's based on money. And they were trying to sell a Batman, a superhero movie, when Superman had driven it into the ground. So Hollywood only knows known properties. And when they said, hey, we're going to get Jack Nicholson to play the bad guy, of course the studio said cha-ching at that time because yeah. he was the height of his money. But man, was he a bad joker. He was great as the the gangster before he turned. I had nothing problem. I still And there's a line I love, this town needs an enema. That's a great line. Mm-hmm. But... Man, he was he not suited to be that character. It was written wrong. He was just... When you see him go into... A, I can't remember if it's a bank where he's just kind of bouncing in and just like bouncing to that Prince music. It's just... Did he watch Bozo for inspiration for this or some <laughs> other like Ringling Brothers clown? Because that's not the kind of clown this is. Yeah, it just... It drove me nuts. And then it, it, what drove me more nuts is like... I was the only person that had that opinion in any room I was in. People were like, what are you doing? What are you doing? To the point where my frustration led into me dream casting who I would have cast. (laughs) And I literally ruined a 20-year-old's. He told me I ruined that movie for him because I I would have cast Tim Curry. Oh, that's a good idea. Because it ever had a creepy smile that made a logo of a of a midnight movie rocky horror picture show it was him i mean but of course he wasn't the big box office draw at that point that's to that's to the point i got and it was just out of sheer frustration i was like who who could do it who could do it and that's what it is so yeah no i did not like jack nicholson i at this point would have to go i would still say mark mark hamill would be my number one but i do give honorable mention to heath ledger really seeing what that story was about and knowing like that he had to portray some of the known qualities of the joker but to the point of in a realistic setting he would just be completely insane he played the insane part of him which everybody knows he has but i've had friends that thought he went too too far into the reality with it but it's like dude that world wouldn't have taken the guy walking around with the cane. I, I think Heath Ledger did a, an amazing job. That pencil trick thing is memorable. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, come on. That's... Uh, it's it's so good. But there's no better straightforward, like, comic book, you know, animated Joker that better than Mark Hamill. He, he literally dove in and, you know, created the laugh and all that stuff. And that's the great thing. He's another one... What do we know him for? Luke Skywalker, the handsome young blonde guy. But look what he ended up being able to do. Create this another entire life as an actor, as a character actor, but he kind of had to do it off screen. But, you know, it's an amazing thing. And it actually has afforded him because so many people are nerdy about his performance as Joker and now have given him roles where he's actually able to play more character roles. So what about the one that's been playing in... A lot of the more recent movies, the um, Harley Quinn, all, all those movies. Well, the thing is, the I, I, thing I'd love to say is because we uh, we honor and revere the Batman animated series so much is I love that Harley Quinn was an invention oh of that gosh. show. Like, it's Paul Dini is the guy that created her. It's amazing how she's evolved and the fact that she's kind of, kind of become more dominant than Joker in people's hearts. I call her the Deadpool of the DC Universe. Mm -hmm. She's kind of like the one where you just know she's going to be saying anything and everything. Definitely if you watch the the Harley Quinn show on HBO Max, know that that's not a kid's show. Anyway, that is a hard R-rated show. She's so much fun. Like, I I think, to me, I I don't think of it as just the Joker anymore. Now there's that whole yin-yang of both of them. Um, I I really enjoy that. Um, I've had a lot more enjoyment out of Harley Quinn when she separates from Joker. uh Because it just goes to show, okay, the Joker's obsessive qualities actually make it so that he can't get his goals in a lot of cartoon universes because he's gotten so obsessed with Batman. But she 
just goes goal focused. Yeah, she's actually more positive character in a way, mm-hmm. as much as it's weird to say. The, Paul Dini wrote the great episode, and it you can actually get it in comic book form called Mad Love, where it shows the literally serious. Um, abusive relationship between mm-hmm. the both of them. As cartoony as it's drawn, it's definitely serious and shows that he's very much an abusive boyfriend, I guess we'd say. But yeah. So, so we were looking at the Joker, and I kind of mentioned that this is a multiverse thing. In one of those comics that came out not that long ago, they admitted that there are three Jokers. And one of them is a lot more of a gangster One of them is more of a prankster. And then one of them is an anarchist. And one of the things I found really interesting is that actually kind of maps to the different eras of Joker portrayal. In that you kind of have the Cesar Romero, um, the Jack Nicholson being the... The The gangster. The gangster. uh, Mark Hamill being more the jokester. And then Heath Ledger being the anarchist. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that, I, yeah, DC's been doing a lot of universe expanding lately, where they'll do a they'll do kind of a mini series, and then it gets popular, and then they go, okay, we we got a now a new universe, and which I think is kind of cool because in the old days with comics, they would do these events that reset everything, oh and like pretty gosh. much almost every year or maybe every two years, and it was just it was tiresome. But the way that DC's handling it now, I think it's kind of cool. Okay. So I think we've kind of gone through a lot of the major characters. I mean, you got we didn't Robin. Do Gordon yet, we didn't do Gordon yet. I don't actually have anything listed for Gordon. Um, okay, so go ahead and talk to me about so, your Gordon. Okay, so this is a bone of contention with me too. Is that with the '90s movies, is they hired an old gentleman who's a fine actor, the kind of guy you want to see as a southern grandpa or maybe a sher- local sheriff kind of thing in a small town. Fine actor, nothing against him, but. They didn't do anything with him. They you would only literally see him at press conferences, and just <laughs> and then like you know I don't even think I remember seeing him throw the the bat signal switch. So it was really that was one of those things where it's the big Hollywood thing. Oh, we don't have time for Gordon. Okay, well we're not going to make him a character. I'm sorry, I come from the Batman Year One school, which is a mm. Frank Miller comic, and you can actually watch the animated as well. And that one is uh, it's basically Batman coming back to Gotham after being gone and training uh, overseas, and or Bruce Wayne, wherever, right? Just early days of figuring out how he's going to fight crime. And then Gordon just coming to Gotham as well the same year and learning of all the corruption and all that stuff. Batman Begins is very much based on this. So Gordon, until I saw until I saw Gary Oldman, honestly, like mm-hmm. that's that scene with the fact that they gave Gordon as the guy that found Bruce from the crime alley when his parents got killed that was that was amazing just 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 to make that because he's so part of the family it's the bat fam there was those people and if they if you leave them aside it, it just it kind of falls apart in a lot of ways so yeah gary Ullman was great just to get to see him to be in a tank and in mm-hmm. dark knight rises and yeah and all that stuff and you know yeah he was he and he was great because number one he, like harry potter was the first time he ever got to be like a good guy he's always been a villain and he says i don't necessarily want to be but that's where people always put me cast me so to see him really be able to have that role where he was a strong character but also very warm character and that's what's really interesting because i don't actually think of gary oldman as anything but commissioner gordon like when i think of gary oldman and i look at his face i'm like that's commissioner gordon yeah see that's then that's it but if you think about the fifth element he was that really weird villain in that that's him uh-huh yeah um but he's had a lot of roles that i just don't remember now. yeah and he, yeah well there's a lot of stuff i've been while i've been living with marshall has been trying to introduce him to certain things and of course he's busy a lot so we haven't been able to but yeah he's played a lot of really weird characters him with dreadlocks as a pimp in uh true romance which is a script that was written by Tar- quentin tarantino and he's all, let me ask you a question. <laughs> he's got gold teeth. And just like, he can do anything. We've seen him do Winston Churchill. The man is a chameleon. He could do whatever he needs to do. But I really liked seeing him be able to play a straight, uh, heartwarming kind of kind of character. So I'd say he's definitely my, my number one, Gordon. 
Okay. So we've got we've got some confirmations of two movies that have come out. We've talked a lot about The Batman with Robert Pattinson. Um, we know that's coming out, and that's coming out after the Flash movie, which... Yeah. <laughs> these movies, um, I, we'll see how much these movies can withstand. I know Marvel can kind of get away with anything after Endgame, and they're making mm-hmm. this Spider-Man movie that's... These we're talking. Both of these movies are going to be kitchen sinks. The Spider Man and the Flash movie. They are throwing everything at them. Everything from the past history of this of the movies, the the franchises. They're just throwing at. So apparently, do you you do you know who's going to be in this Flash movie? Look it up. And what we're saying is they're doing. If you remember in, I guess it was in Batman v Superman where the Flash came bursting through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to Bruce. They're basically expanding on that idea and doing Flashpoint, I believe, is what they're doing with the script. And what Flashpoint is, he can time travel, uses that kind of science to allow him to actually uh, travel back in time and stuff like that. So they're doing something based on that, and that's how they're incorporating other universes. Um, So apparently Michael Keaton... So what this is looking like, I'm looking at this cast list, and it it says Ben Affleck... And Michael Keaton, both as Bruce Wayne, and with Ezra Miller being Barry Allen and Barry Allen yeah. being able to time travel, also Henry Allen is rumored to be a character in this. That actually tells me something else, and this is going to get into another movie that's we've heard confirmed is going to be in the works, that the Michael Keaton Bruce Wayne is Bruce Wayne of the future when he's retired. I'm willing to bet that this is... Old Man Bruce. Yeah, from Batman Beyond. From Batman Beyond, which I think I had some super fond memories of those old cartoons. Yeah, I know. I know. They had some villain issues. But Batman Beyond was such an interesting... Concept. It was a good concept. It was an interesting match of just, yeah, the young man taking it on uh, after Bruce had kind of retired. I, I, I... I enjoyed the concept. Didn't much enjoy, like you said, the plot issues because it didn't really give him many vil- great villains to fight. So it kind of dragged a little bit. But yeah, great suit, great concept. And I think I'd like Michael Keaton better as the old Bruce than... In fact, I loved him in the Spider-Man movie. So that'll give you an idea. I don't hate yeah, Michael good, Keaton. Though. It's just about in that movie, in that character at that time. I'll I'm interested him. in a Batman Beyond live action movie. Yeah, that right? would be great. Even if they could find a way to do it on HBO Max or something like that, I don't know. Uh, but uh, because it's going to be hard, I think it might be better on uh, to do something on an HBO Max because I think jumping straight into it, it might be hard for people to see it, you know, not knowing the backstory. Like a lot of people got now got roped into our world with Star Wars and Ahsoka and Mandalorian, where we've known her for We're like, years. Wait, Ahsoka's coming back? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now we get to see her live action. So I don't know. It, it, it'll be on depend on how they handle it, but they could even just do a movie or a series of Batman Beyond or find a way to do it. I hope they turn it around. It's been tricky. Like I, be, growing up as a DC person. It's been rough for the past couple of years. The DC Universe itself was kind of really gave me a place because there was just shows where the people would deep dive into the content of the comics. And I felt like, oh, now I have a place where I can kind of like be proud to be a DC fan. But now they're folding a lot of that stuff into HBO Max, which is fine. Yeah, we've kind of, I've gotten them into some DC stuff, Doom Patrol. And I think they can turn it around. My big thing is Jeff, Jeff John's. He stepped down yeah. from a exec role to come down and kind of turn the ship on a lot of this stuff. We'll see, though. I'm the one person in the house that didn't really enjoy Wonder Woman 84, so I kind of hold this stuff loosely. I'll give it a shot. I won't turn it down out, out the gate. We, we could probably come back and talk about Snyder Cut after it comes out. It's coming out yeah. in, Mar- in March. I'll so. give it a shot, but I, I don't have high hopes. And I'm going to be honest. Ray Fisher, the controversy surrounding him has... I don't think he's doing himself any favors. I, I'm not going to say whether he's he's right or wrong on he's this. He's the cyborg actor Yeah, he, he played League. a cyborg, and he's he and several other actors have been making allegations of abuse on the sets for some of these movies. And if there really is this abuse, and I can't say whether there is or not because I'm not there, then that's a horrible thing and it needs to be made to stop. But the way that he's pushing it right now and the way that he's talking about things online 
it's going to hurt his career because nobody will want to work with him. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't understand it, especially, like, maybe he'll become an advocate, maybe, but I don't know that his acting is going to, like, withstand it. But again, Hollywood is changing after the Weinstein yeah. and all that stuff. We'll see. I, I'm all for there being positive change, but it just seems that the younger generation, which isn't mine, and I don't want to sound like the old guy, but to complain to the press being your only method, it, I don't know if it is, but, you know, the Star Wars kids are now going off on Star Wars, and I'm just, like, feeding a news cycle, but are, is it really good for humanity? Is it really... I don't know. Like, I, I mean, do your, do your shot. If it doesn't work out, move on. If there's something criminal that actually happens, absolutely stand up and say that, but... At some point, you just got to wonder, like, my cynical side said, oh, is he trying to promote the, the just the Schneider cut? You know, is this this because I know there's there's definitely spin doctors that do that kind of stuff. I'm not saying he did that, but I really enjoyed his portrayal of Cyborg. It, I still have the the original art animated Teen Titan um, Cyborg as yeah, Who the Carrie Payton is, is his name. If you guys know yeah. me, it was Ezekiel on uh on the Walking Dead. Um, yeah. yeah, great great portrayal. And I and I'm one of the few people that actually liked Justice League. Uh, I know it wasn't a perfect movie, but yeah. out of a bad circumstance, he it seemed like Joss Whedon pulled it off. I, but again, who knows what really happened on those sets? But anyways, I there's I have hope for DC. It it'll take a lot to turn around when you make these big multi movie plans. It, 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 it'll take a while. We'll see. The, I think Flash was going to be the real test of whether or not they can do this universe type stuff. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Because we'll see what Snyder cuts like. You know, four hours is not going to make it any better necessarily based on what I already saw. So, yeah. Okay, so that's that's kind of everything. I mean, yeah. If you wanna if you wanna catch up on a lot of Batman stuff, they've got a lot of the movies and shows on HBO Max. Uh, thank you all for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on the things we talked about in today's podcast. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard on Instagram. Uh, for updates, keep an eye on Elated Geek on Instagram or Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send your geek obsessions or topics you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. And until next time, geek out.